O Lord, uphold thou me, that I may uplift thee. Amen. I remember some years ago, sitting with a wonderful woman, a member of my parish, and her two young children just a few hours after her husband suddenly and tragically died. He was a young man, seemingly in the prime of his life, and his death came as a great shock. Together, this new widow and I told her children that their father wasn't coming home, that his heart had stopped beating. In the hours that followed, there were lots of tears, lots of silence, and lots of shock that something so unimaginable could happen. And almost immediately, friends and members of the family began arriving and arriving at the house to offer whatever comfort they could, to be there in solidarity and support. I'll never forget that at some point during that afternoon, a, a very well-meaning member of the family came into the room, scooped up the two children, held them tightly in her arms with tears running down her cheeks, and she said, it's okay. God needed your daddy in heaven. God called him home, but it's going to be okay. I immediately cringed. I knew, I knew this wonderful woman was trying to be helpful, but the God I love does not take fathers from young children or husbands from wives. The God I know does not cause suffering or devastate families. As well-intentioned as this woman's words were, they were just bad theology. At the beginning of our gospel for this morning, our very short gospel for this morning, Jesus deals directly with this kind of bad theology. In the first three verses of our lesson from John, Jesus gives us a glimpse of his response to the age-old question, why do bad things happen? What is the source and cause of disease? Why should anyone be born blind? Here, the bad theology comes from the disciples who begin by asking Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The disciples assume, they assume that if this man is blind, then he or his family must have sinned in some way that caused God to make him blind. No, Jesus says, that is not how God works. God does not cause disease any more than he takes fathers from children. God does not give us sickness in response to our sinfulness any more than God gives us health in response to our righteousness. The Gospels teach us that God loves each and every one of us immeasurably, and it is God's desire that we should all be whole and healthy. Sickness, disease, and death are not divine decrees, but the terrible reality of living in a fallen world an imperfect world, a world that is still in need of redeeming. The worst thing we can do to someone is to make them believe that whatever they are suffering comes from God. God does not cause suffering. Life causes suffering in abundance. Quite to the contrary, God seeks to redeem suffering. 
I mean, that's the message of the cross. Think about it. That is the message of the cross. We, we nailed Jesus to that tree. We, human beings, decided that Jesus should die. But God, God refused to let that stand, to let that be the last word. God, in God's love, chose to redeem the worst that we could possibly do to God's Son. God turned the crucifixion upside down and transformed an execution into the means by which death is conquered and we are promised life beyond life. Now, of course, we have free will and we make choices. My father, God bless him, smoked two packs of Camel unfiltered cigarettes for 50 years, every day, two packs of Camel unfiltered cigarettes. It is perhaps no accident that that choice led to emphysema and to his death at 67. The truth is sometimes we make choices in this life that bring about consequences that we would rather not have. But sometimes disease happens to the most innocent and we say, she was so wonderful. She didn't deserve to have that happen to her. However, whether our choices play a role in the things that plague us or not, Our God desires only to love us, to heal us, to redeem us. God does not make us sick. Why then? Why then does the young child die? Why is the fine gentleman at the peak of his life struck with cancer? Why are those we love taken from us far too soon? I don't know. I don't know. Life can be cruel. I don't have the answers to these questions. My experience tells me that these things are just part of living, a regrettable part of living, but givens for those of us who walk the earth. What my faith does tell me is that nothing in this life need to be, needs to be meaningless or pointless. What my faith does tell me is that God reigns beyond and over all things in this life. You see, I think that everything in this life can be redemptive. Not everything is redemptive, but everything can be. There is nothing that we experience that God cannot touch and change for the better. In our lesson for today, Jesus literally redeems the man born blind by curing his blindness and revealing to all who want to see it the glory of God. But where is the redemption for all those who are not healed? It's easy to talk about miracles in the Bible But where is the redemption for those whose suffering continues? I'm reminded of a scene from the movie adaptation of the book called The Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom. If you've never read The Hiding Place, you should. It's one of those books we all should read. In this particular scene takes place in the German concentration camp, Ravensbrück. Corey and her sister Betsy are imprisoned there along with 10,000 other women living in terrible conditions, cold and hungry and lice-ridden. In this scene, they are gathered together with some of the women in the barracks amongst the stacks of bunk beds, and Betsy is reading the Bible. One of the other women in the room calls out from her bunk and mocks them for believing in God. She says, if your God is such a good God, why does he allow this kind of suffering? 
Dramatically, she tears off bandages and old rags that cover her hands and reveals her fingers that have been crushed and broken and says, I'm the first violinist of the symphony orchestra. Did your God will this? For a moment, no one answers. Then Corey Ten Boom steps up beside her sister and says, we can't answer that question. All we know is that our God came to this earth and became one of us and he suffered with us and was crucified and died. And he did it all for love. A wonderful preacher once said that when tragedy strikes, it's like being in a large room crowded with people and suddenly all the lights go out. You're surrounded by people, but it's completely dark, so dark that you can't see your hand in front of your face. At first you ask, why did the lights go out? But what you really need is someone with a flashlight, someone who can show you the way, someone who can act as a guide. In the same way, when someone we love dies or gets sick, we ask, why? How could this happen? The truth is, we don't know the answer to that question. There is much about life that remains of mystery. But we do know, as I have said, that God didn't do it. God gives love, not illness and death. But more important than the answer to the question why, we, in those circumstances, we need a guide, someone with a flashlight to show us the way to the other side of our questions and our grief. We need someone who has been through death and seen God's life on the other side. In Jesus, we believe we have that guide. We may not have all the answers to our questions, but because of Jesus, we have not been left alone in the darkness. Christ has come to show us the way. Finally, it seems to me that life has everything to do with attitude. Someone once said to Helen Keller, what a pity you have no sight. And Helen Keller said, yes, but what a pity that so many have sight but cannot see. There are so many ways to view our lives, but essentially I think we can live in two ways. We can either live with our eyes attuned to the promise of living or to the problems of living. We can live attuned to the promise of living or the problems of living. Life is either a treasure to be discovered or a series of problems to be faced with a new problem always lurking around the corner. Tragedies come and suffering happens, but if we believe in redemption, if we believe in the power of resurrection, then life, even when it is most difficult, is still full of promise because our God seeks to redeem that which is worst about life. To live in the power of God's love is to look for something redemptive in everything life hands us. It is to believe that living always has value and that in suffering there can be healing and hope and love. Amen.